I was desperate, you know, at the time I was 17, 18, unemployed, you know, and I was desperate to, you know, to get a break. And I knew that if I did get a try, I would, you know, I would grab the chance. I think it was always going to be boxing to me. I stepped into the gym as a 10 or 11 year old. Boxing just took hold of my heart straight away. I love everything about the sport of boxing. Hello, I'm Marie Crow, and this is We Become Heroes, the podcast that explores how elite athletes and sports people reach the top of their game and the lessons that they learned along the way. I'm delighted to say my guest today is Munster and Ireland rugby player CJ Stander. CJ, you're still anyway a rugby player, but soon to be former rugby player. How does that feel? Hi, Marie. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's um, I'm excited about the future. And um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm proud of my uh, career as well so far, you know, so a few, few more games left to me and uh, I'm looking forward to what's next. How difficult a decision was it to make? Um, on, the, on the day, it was probably when I actually said it, it was a bit of a sense of relief, you know, because um, it's been coming in the last few weeks and months and um, I'm very, very uh, happy with my decision because for me, my decision come around, came around about my family um, my main reason was my family and I want to connect with them again and um, I want to do sacrifice sorry not, not sacrifice but I wanted to sacrifice something for them as well you know so um, the decision was easy um, it still is uh, what, what do you think you're going to miss most about it uh, I think just uh, being part of a team a uh, team that's striving to be best the, the best of himself week in and week out and um, I pick, we pick each other up and um, just, just the camaraderie we have in the squad, you know, especially with Munster. I think we're such a uh, close-knit group that um, it's going to be tough not being part of it and um, not having that. You still have that support with your family, but having that support on a daily basis. We've all seen uh, images of you and smiles when you crash into somebody. You seem to really love the contact of the game. Are you going to miss that? That is probably, uh, sorry, to come back to your first, second question, yes, that's probably the big thing I'm going to miss the most. Uh, a lot of people has had advice for me not to go into contact, but um, I actually like that feeling. Um, you get a bit of a tingle, I get a tingle in my body, and uh, yeah, I enjoy it a lot. And, and just that part of the game, that's a place where I can show dominance, and um, yeah, I enjoy, I've enjoyed that since I was a kid. I work with Donico Callahan, and he said, like, shortly after he retired, there was a guy cycling up beside him on a bicycle and, you know, he had this urge to <laughs> hit him in the shoulder because he missed it so much. So I completely understand what you mean. And just in terms of, look, I know we haven't had fans for the last while and who knows when we're going to have them back in large numbers, but how difficult is it going to be to kind of put that behind you, having those moments of running out into packed stadiums and, you know, the buzz and the feel of all the people? Yeah, that's, that's one of the, if you look at the top three, that's probably going to be number two, you know, running in, out in a full uh, packed uh, Thurman Park, you know, and uh, Viva is, the thing that, that probably people don't know, that that last 10% or last uh, chance pitch we really need comes from the supporters, you know, and um, you can feel it in games, you can feel that vibe that's created the whole day, um, that atmosphere is pushing you on the pitch, you know, and that's, I'm going to miss that because, you don't get that. You're never going to get it again. Um, I, my last three games with, with Ireland, I was taking pictures and videos and no one knew I was going to retire. I knew it. But um, I knew that's the last time I'm going to be able to walk on the pitch as well um, with not everyone giving, anyone giving me trouble. <laughs> yeah, true. I'll probably, I'll probably have to streak to do it again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get into our set question. So what's your earliest memory of sport? Earliest memory of sport was... The uh, game I watched was 1995 World Cup. Um, I watched all those games. I was literally glued to the TV. Um, and in my first memory as a as, as playing sport was when I was seven years old. Uh, on a frosty morning uh, in South Africa, we played bare feet. And uh, I just remember running around, trying to tiptoe around, um, around people. So uh, those are my first memories. Did you play other sports besides rugby when you were young? Yes, I did. Um, I was I was busy, you know. I, um, I my dad always said I was trying to make him poor in one year because I played golf, athletics. Um, I was in, into horse riding. Um, if there was anything to do with winning, I wanted to do it. And uh, but the two ones I enjoyed the most was uh, athletics and rugby. Was there a certain type of athletics that you did? Was it running? Was it the field part? Which which bit? Yeah. 
I was a discus uh, thrower and a shot putter. Uh, when I was younger and a bit skinnier, I could do about 100 meter sprint, you know, but I soon realized I'm not the best at it. So I just pulled away and went to where the heavy, heavy guys go to. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you could have been um, a hepathlete or something yeah. like that with the, the skills that you had. So when did you first realize that you were good at sports? Um, I think as a kid, I was a bit bigger than anyone else, and I probably, uh, I probably had a different mindset than uh, most of the kids around me. Um, but um, when I knew I was good at sports is when I got selected for um, an, an, an 16 um, trials. Um, and I was yeah, selected for under 16 trials of rugby in my region. You know, and I was on, and there was like, I think the trials had like 500 players, and I was selected for a team of 23, so 22. So I knew then that I'm actually I can actually play this game. <laughs> did you um, did you have childhood heroes when you were growing up, sports stars that you wanted to emulate? Yes, uh, there was a few of them. Uh, Cornell Krieger, I don't know a lot of people remember him. He was an uh, uh, open side flanker for Western Province. He just played a very physical game, an uh, honest game, and uh, he was just in it to win it. And uh, Bobby Skins, that he was more of a flashy guy. And as I grew older, um, I when I started to realize that sport is just more than the physical side. Um, a lot of guys, I would look into their mental side. Was if you look at a guy like Tiger, if he was in the zone, um, no one's going to get them out of it, you know. So I really enjoyed the way he took the game to another level with his mindset, and um, where he went to as a, as a as an athlete. Is I looked up to the way he approached the game. So even at an early age, you were quite aware that, OK, you had talent, but there were other parts like the mindset that were important as well to success as an athlete. Yeah, I I remember I was quite good with um, in athletics with discus, you know, so I just realised I, I wasn't the biggest discus thrower, but I realised the more I throw and the more repetitions I put in, the better I'm going to be. And that just gave me confidence going into a Saturday. Um, when I was 13, 14, 13, 14, 15, my granddad bought me a discus ring in the middle of my dad's field. He was so angry. Um, we, we still don't do at the end of it, but I used to throw on a Saturday after I trained during the week at school. I used to throw probably 500 discus in, um, in one day, you know, and I put blisters on my fingers, but I knew going into a meet the next Saturday that I'm going to out throw anyone because I've done the work. And I, I probably got cocky. Um, sorry for the word, but I used to, you know, the spin. Um, the guys would go in and do the spin, and they would throw 40 meters, and I would go in and stand still and throw, just literally rip it and throw 42. And um, that's probably, but I knew I had that confidence because I could do it because I've, I've done it for weeks and weeks, and the reputations were behind me, you know. It sounds like, as well as having that bit of confidence, you had a huge amount of determination as well. Yeah. Um, I must have probably got it from my mother. Uh, she has been, uh, she played the netball, uh, professional as well. So she was, she was probably someone I looked up to when I was a kid, you know, and just the way she played and the mindset she had. She had to look after us for all week and going to a Saturday and play a game. Uh, and she just wanted to win everything. And my granddad as well. Um, he just said, after one thing he learned me off the top of my head is, you're going to do it, might as well do it well and win it, you know, so. <laughs> um, at a young age, I was just going into things, making sure I was going to be the best player. And uh, then I realized um, later on as well, you want to go in there, be the best and make sure you win everything. But you don't want to be the show or be the man walking around. You want to be that guy who wants to do all the work. And that's it. You know it. No one else has to know. It. You don't have to tell people about it. Your work will tell the story. It sounds like you had really good role models. And mm. I always say, like, you know, people often say that it's particularly amateur sport, that it's often a sacrifice and you have to give up your evenings and you're, you're trying to work it and juggle family. But the way I look at it is that it's such a good example for kids to go and see parents going out and doing their training and playing their matches and heading off the weekend to go out and, and do something that's almost kind of shown how important it is to be committed and dedication. Okay, you might be missing out on time here and there, but you're setting a really good example for the people that are, are looking up to you. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's, if I look back at my own daughter now, she's only 19 months, but she's got a mother that's a, a Commonwealth swimmer and uh, me then as well in the mix, probably 
No, that is good, but I go out and do my work, you know, so, yeah, I think she's going to have an interesting upbringing. Uh, <laughs> but I think you need to, what I had, I had people, as you just said, role models in my life that were setting standards for me week in and week out and um, ah, small things. Even my granddad at the age of 68, 70, going for a three-kilometer jog with me, um, even if he's behind me, and I always pushed me, you know, and um, oh, one great story is my mom was next to the pitch, uh, I was nine years old. I was playing with the 11s because they, they, they need, needed someone. And the guy tackled me so hard that I wanted to cry. <laughs> and I was like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, she literally just pushed me back into the pitch and told me, next time he comes at you and you have the ball, just hand them, like, hand them off in the face and just hurt them back because you can do it legally. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> since then, uh, my mom was ruthless with us next to the pitch, you know, because, again, you were there to do a job, might as well do it well. It sounds like a great childhood. What describe it for me, if you don't mind? Just like where did you grow up? What was life like around you? Yeah, I uh, grew up in George on a farm, uh, probably ten kilometers from from town. So for me, a normal day would be as I would be dropped into town with my dad, went to pick up the workers, and I would have to cycle back that ten or twelve kilometers back home every day since I was six or seven years old. You know, so um, that kept me fit anyway and busy. Um, and then uh, yeah, so we would. Um, go to school every day, do sports afterwards, then do extra sports because we were, me and my brother, I'm saying we, we were doing extra sports after that because we had to do rugby and athletics or rugby and golf. So um, then go out and being expected to work on the farm as well. So the work ethic we got from young was, from, from younglings was, uh, was unbelievable, you know. So then we went to boarding school. I went to boarding school in uh, Oakdale, um, which is a small town, probably two hours from Cape Town. Same thing, uh, we had to mock the cows in the morning, agricultural school, then go to school, do sports, do the farm work and then go study. So the back burner was a study. Um, we probably didn't put a lot of time into studies, we should have, but uh, we got through that and we got our degrees and we got out, out of that end. So when you were developing as an athlete and you thought, okay, there could be potentially a career here for me in sport, what did you have to work on most? Just. To, from a rugby point of view, what were the areas of your game that you you do, you needed to develop and you knew you needed to develop when you were growing up? Yeah, uh, biggest thing probably just um, accepting defeats. I think sometimes you you play well and uh, you don't win, but then you there's you can be disappointed, you know. But you need to realize as well the other team and the other player or the other individual athlete is good as well. He's trained well, and that's his time to shine. And you need to take your defeats uh, even better than your wins because that just builds character. You know, you don't want to be moping around the place and dragging yourself down for two or three or four days because the prep for next week is then um, hampered by you not being yourself and not being able to um, produce the goods, you know. So just making sure that if I lose, I'm the best, then the best loser there is. Take my defeat, but then make sure I take that feeling into the next meet or the next game. Um, and then just being um, just being constantly um, good every weekend, you know. Um, you have to bring the good every weekend because that brings that that yeah. You, you're consistent, then, you know. So that consistency puts you on another level from from the back. It sounds like you had great awareness as well from from that point of view. A lot of people don't maybe realize the value of being able to deal with defeat until they're a little bit older, but you seem to kind of grasp the importance of that quite young as well. Yeah, I think um, what helped me a lot is my mom and dad put a lot of trust in me as a, as a young, young boy in South Africa. Like I had to look after the farm by myself for some weekends, but as, at the age of 13, 14, they'll go away and leave me there for two or three days and I'll have to look after it, you know, so... I think that side of things made me an adult way quicker and I could see different things, you know, and um, I wouldn't change the thing, you know, because it, it gave me responsibility uh, for my own actions. And um, they always said that if, you, if you're responsible for something good or bad, you need to be, you need to take what's coming your way. So uh, I had a bit of awareness growing up and they just embedded it into me when I was a kid, you know, so that reflected into my sport and all the stuff I did after that. Do you think that helped you then just when you were a senior player in games, knowing that you've been able to deal with massive responsibility and that you can 
I suppose, maybe just control things a little bit more yourself by your actions and knowing that you can get the outcome by what you do. Yeah, for sure. Um, that responsibility is a funny thing because uh, if I look at my step, I arrived in the squad first two years, I was just doing my own thing, whatever, myself, and then suddenly, boom, you're in a leadership group and um, you have to start thinking for a squad and the people around you, you know, and uh, take responsibility of a squad um, as a leadership group. And yeah, um, luckily I've had that experiences again uh, in my younger years, so I knew how to work with it. And um, the biggest thing that I can probably learn someone out there or even tell is you need to come, I did anyway, compartmentalize stuff. Like I can control this, I can't control the, these two things. Then the things I can't control, I can find someone can help me or I just put it away out of my mind completely because again, it's all about outcome. And if the outcome is not um, favorable in your for you, then you need to change something. You were captain of a lot of teams as well at underage and, and youth level. So I'm not really surprised when I hear these stories about what you were like as a kid that you were entrusted with captaining teams so often. Yeah, um, I was lucky enough um, to captain most of the teams that I played with, you know, and um, that is a big responsibility, but I think I didn't see it as a burden. I saw it as an opportunity to better myself and to actually take the squad at that moment or the team to a place where we're successful. Because, like, again, I wasn't there and I'm not there just to play the game and uh, say, oh, well, good luck. Um, I've been part of squads and where we need to be successful and we wanted to be, you know. So I think my first taste of real success is we won, uh, we have a competition to Africa, Crown Week, for, it's for the under 18 uh, rugby players in Africa. And we were from, I was from the smallest provinces in Africa and we won that outright against the Cheetahs, who was one of the biggest franchises, you know. So it's my first time really at 18 where I got some, I put a lot of work into the squad. I was there the year before. We build this group and the squad together and we got a great outcome. So that's the first time I've tasted success and yeah, I've been hungry for it since. <laughs> it sounds like you had an awful lot of opportunities to learn and that you took them as well because not everybody takes the opportunities that come their way. Yeah, I I think why I took them is, and it worked out my way is, um, in South Africa especially, that there's a lot of talent. Um, in anything you do. So if you don't take a chance and use your opportunity, there is literally not another one coming your way. So um, I knew if I had to do, take them and um, yeah, push myself to the next level. And yeah, look, opportunities come and they go and um, you you learn out of them and stuff. And uh, But you need to know there's, there's a hand in the game, sorry, in rugby anyway, there's only a hand few that's going to come your way. Um, you need to prepare yourself based on the decisions you make off the pitch um, is going to impact what you're going to do on the pitch. So it's, it is, you need to know, set out your goals, what do you want to do, what do you want to achieve? And if you're comfortable with what you want to achieve, there's no, no stopping you. So when you were maybe transitioning to uh, an adult rugby player, what were your goals then? Uh, yeah, adult rugby player then, I... Firstly, when I if I look at a Manchester squad, I wanted to start uh, not just in the Pro 14, but I wanted, or the Pro 12. Then I wanted to start in Europe because I know starting in Europe means you're the starting guy in that position. And then I wanted to play for Ireland after that. And then um, then the challenge of silverware came along, you know, so I wanted to win a Grand Slam. I was lucky enough to be part of that squad in 2018. The one thing I didn't really achieve is winning silverware with Manchester and um, senior side. But look. That's why the goals and um, you, yeah. Look, I don't have. A, I, I have another six games. I still have six games <laughs> to get goals. So still a goal of mine. That's so true. Um, so, at what stage did you think, okay, I can mix it here with the best in the world? I can. I am a top class rugby player. I am here with with the best, and um, I can go on and have a career with the best rugby players in the world. Um, yeah, I think when I the light bulb went on is when I started playing for the Bulls in Super Rugby. Um, that was 20, 2010. I realized that I can actually, I had an unbelievable game against the Brumbies in the Super Rugby. Um, I realized there's opportunity for me, but then the me being too small and all the hurdles came my way. Then that was probably on the back of my uh, thought process. I knew I can, I can make it. And then I think my best year. 
uh, with Munster was 2015, uh, 2016. Um, then I realized that I can I can push on here and hopefully be a big part of the squad and yeah, be a big part of rugby in general. Um, but by the way, I'm going to play or, or play it anyway. Tell me about the too small thing because I, I find that fascinating, I suppose, probably because I didn't know you then and I've only seen the career that you had when you came to, to Munster and to Ireland and it's kind of hard to nearly marry those two descriptions of, of you then and, and you being perceived to being too small. Yeah, well, I uh, picked up 10 cages when I came over here, so uh, <laughs> six months, so that completely changed. But no, I, uh, yeah, it was just, um, I don't know if there was a, a overflow of loose forwards or there was a shortage of hookers, but um, I was earmarked to being too small and then I had to move to hooker um, to fill a void. I don't know if there was a need to fill a void or it was actually an honest call of me from from them to do it, but uh, yeah, it just got to a point where I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. You know, it's just like I'm not gonna get bigger. Um, I remember just googling other happy players like a uh, Richie McCall and a David Popok, and I realized I'm actually bigger than these guys. You know, so I just knew that um, there's something different that I'm not seeing at that moment, and I can't control it. So yeah, I just had to move on. <laughs> Was it hard to put on ten kg? Is it, sorry? Is it difficult to put that on? Depends which way we picked it. I picked it up the wrong way. Um, I went on holiday. I got married. <laughs> I went to honeymoon. So I left at 106, came back 117 and not from the gym. So <laughs> it was very easy to pick it up, but it was very difficult to lose it and then pick it up in mm. uh, rugby sense. It took me a good two years um, to pick it up in muscle and not just fat. Yeah, it sounds like it was a bit of a bit of a slog anyway. Yeah. Um, so what were your first impressions of, of Limerick and Munster when you arrived? Uh, no, like I fell in love straight away. You know, we um, I flew into Cork and um, we drove down to Limerick and I was there for two or three weeks. Uh, Joe Omri, my wife, then came and joined me, but we fell in love straight away, traveled around Limerick. What I felt anyway in Limerick, what I saw and I still believe is that... Um, there's, if you work hard, you're honest, and um, you give you everything, it's going to come back to you, you know, and that's what the people, they live that way. Um, they're good people in Limerick, honest people, hardworking, and they have this in this massive, massive support for Munster. And that's all I wanted to do is play for, for the people, play for Munster, and, and give them enjoyment. And uh, if I succeeded in that, then I'm happy, you know. That is probably a goal for me that I didn't mention earlier. But um, I just fell in love straight away. Um, I struggled with the weather, I'm not going to lie. Uh, it was difficult. I never trained with a jacket on or a peony. But I was the guy of two weeks who had four layers of clothes, you know, so it just had to be done. Yeah, just acclimatizing. So everybody that I spoke to over the last, um, well, for this podcast has had a setback of some sort, something that they've had to overcome, whether it's not making a team or an injury or just something that hasn't gone the way they wanted it, that they wanted it to go. Is there something that sticks out for you that was a setback that you had to overcome? Yeah, I uh, came over here. Uh, we had three or, three or two weeks of training and then played my first game against Scarlet in Muscat Park and then we played against Glasgow in Thurman Park. Uh, an unbelievable game. I thought, right, this is actually the first time, the first step's been taken here. I was man of the match. Now stuff is going to happen. I broke my finger. And the surgeon at that stage missed something. And I had, should have had an operation. I didn't. Then after six weeks, didn't get fixed. So I was out for like uh, 10 weeks with a broken finger. And um, I just then, after that, coming back into the squad, it was difficult. Because um, everyone was settled in their position. The season has started again. And that was a big setback for me. Um, not just... I, I knew I had to earn my way to the team and my, in the respect, but um, I wanted to play as well, you know, so it was uh, difficult to just get into that squad again. I had to, like, before a year and a half, I had to uh, to make make my dues and play my games, and, yeah, I, I got a break at the end, but that was a tough time in my career. Yeah, I'm sure your determined attitude probably helped along the way as well. Um, when you look back over your career, who has had the biggest impact on you? Of two people, uh, my mom, uh, 100%, and then my wife. Uh, I can honestly say, 
if it's my it wasn't for the two of them, I wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, my mom just embedded hard work um, and honesty in me, and then my wife picked up that um, that just straight from her and just pushed me to be myself and just to be just the support I got from her to push me every day um, to make sure I'm the best player. Um, and training every day uh, meant that I can um, get into the squad and, and start playing, start playing good rugby. It sounds like that support is something that is really important to you, and I suppose it's just been a constant throughout. And you probably needed it when you had it always. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. You know, I think um, you you need it. I needed it, you know, and I couldn't bring my mother over with me. You know, so <laughs> I was lucky enough to marry someone who's exactly like her, and. Uh, I think as a professional athlete, not just a rugby player, you need to make sure the people you surround you with support you and make they have the best interest for you. And I'm talking about friends, uh, family as well, relationships, um, even agents, people, they need to have your best interest at their heart. And they, because they, at the end of the day, they're going to make decisions for you and, and talk to you. And I feel sometimes, if you have the wrong person, they can poison you or just take you off the rails very quickly and it's going to be difficult to come back. So I've been very, very lucky to have guys that got involved. Even if I think back now of someone special, Axel, he didn't have to take me under his wing, but he did. Um, he made sure that I was looked after when I arrived here. But he also made sure, because uh, again, a difficult time in my career was being, I was captain and he was coach. Um, it was the best time in both of our lives. All, all both of us wanted that um, responsibility, but we didn't win. We didn't have the, we didn't have any success that year. We didn't even qualify for um, Europe, and uh, we got a lot of flack for not performing. And it came down to the two of us. But having them in, in that moment, going through all of that years before, just made everything easy to, for me. Is it difficult dealing with criticism when you're a, an athlete and a rugby player and you clearly want to have success and you want to win, but it's just not happening and people don't seem to understand that and still have a go? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's difficult. You know, a lot of people say, I've seen it, professional players, they say they don't read the stuff and it doesn't come to them. It's, it does flow to you, even in a conversation with a friend or someone in town or just someone who's in your, in your, in your circle, you know, but um, it is difficult because I think it's because there's no face to it. And there's no one talking to you through that or even just articles being write, written about players in general. If it's the truth, then we all can handle the truth, I reckon, it, it's, especially at this level. You have to have the comfortable, you have to be comfortable with the, with the honest truth, you know, but sometimes people just come out with some of the weirdest stuff and it hurts. It just hurts because for a fact, not even talking about myself, I know teams and players, coaches, everyone. No one goes out there to lose. No one goes out there to play badly. You can't, you can't control these things. Sometimes the game doesn't go your way or you get injured or you're, uh, you have a niggle that you take into the game. But no one goes out there to lose. No one goes out there to um, make sure that they're going to blow the game. Yet. They go out there to play and to win. And then it hurts when... Especially if someone has played a game, has gone through it, and then still give you trouble about it. Yeah, fortunately, it's not something that's going away either. In fact, it seems that even, it's getting yeah, worse. Even me complaining about it, it's probably going to get trouble for it as well. But like, it's, it's <laughs> never going to go away. Um, and I like there's probably going to be a way to deal with it. But look, I'm going to sit on the farm or in my house one day, and I'm going to read these stuff, things and just laugh at it, you know, because and that doesn't define me as a person maybe they think as a player but it doesn't and you need to take it where it comes from you know um these guys they sometimes uh they just drive things out there to get a name and, and that's fair um but some people work hard to get where they are do you feel that maybe you got a little bit of a harder time than others because you weren't originally from ireland or from munster um I wouldn't say I got a bit more, I got a harder time than anyone else. I think a lot of there's a lot of players out there who's Irish players who get even more slack than me, but it made it easier for people to uh, throw stuff my way because I've got a funny accent or I talk funny or uh, I play a funny game and um, it made it easier, you know, and um, it's just the yeah, it just makes it easy for them to make fun of the foreigner or make fun of the guy who's not like us, you know. So <laughs> so it's like 
there's the circle, I'm outside, everyone's laughing, and I'm like just standing there taking it, you know, and you have to. Um, and I knew I, there's nothing I can say, there's nothing I can call, or I, I can't even call these people. All I can do is go outside, right, play well, and then go, oh, I just showed you. Thanks for coming. Control the controllables, I guess. So when you were growing up and you pictured yourself as a rugby player and you thought, this is the type of rugby player that I'm going to be. And when you look back on all the games that you've played, is there a performance, do you think, that kind of sums up everything about you and the, the player that you wanted to be and the player that you became that defines you, I guess? Uh, yes, it's difficult to put it down to a specific game. There's, there's been a few that I've been very proud of my performances. Um, Chicago, Soldier Field, the second game against the All Blacks uh, in the Viva, uh, my first European game for Monster of the Bench against Toulouse in uh, 2014, my first guy start for Monster at Glasgow. So there's a few performances. I guess if I look back now, I just wanted to give something to the supporters to look at and enjoy. I wanted to win. I wanted to be the best player on the pitch, and I, if I pull it, everything back. I want, to, I want and so want to give something back to the younger players and the way I treat them. And uh, I want to leave something behind for them to, to work on and get better at and, and say that um, they've learned this, they've made it better and they've turned out better players. Or Because um, there's we've played a lot of games and there's nothing that's going to define me a specific game. But if I really leave something behind, it would be that I work, uh, worked hard, I was honest and I... Um, you help the younger guys come through and play well and um, make the squad better and uh, hopefully they pay it forward to someone younger than in the coming years. So will that be your legacy then, do you think, the way that you brought the younger players on and the way you made them feel and the standards that you set? Yeah, yeah. If I can write that at the end of my book, say this is the standards I had. I was available for selection every Monday to train. And um, I left something behind, again, by giving the younger guys um, an evening to the game, how I see it, um, and to just push them to be better so they can pay that, um, pay that forward to the next generation. Because I think if I look back as a leader, I don't really have someone who said, OK, here you go, uh, I'm going to help you. We're going to be, say, a leader the next two or three years for this team. I was just going, kind of boom, you're a leader now, you know, so I would have loved someone pushed me a little bit in the right direction, gave me a few uh, words of wisdom, but um, if I can leave something behind, that would be it. And what about your greatest success? What do you think it is or was? In, in, in rugby? In rugby, yeah. In life, actually, if you want to. <laughs> um, always being myself, um, my family, my daughter and my wife, and uh, just literally going out there uh, Monday to Sunday, giving that all to my all, all to the jersey and uh, never letting my foot off the gas. <laughs> Just listening to you, TJ, you, you seem like you would be the person that would be playing until you're like 40. You know, you <laughs> loved it so much. Yeah. Um, look, I, I'm i jealous of um, leaving the game because um, I know Master's going to be successful. And I said to the boys, in, 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 and Ireland, Ireland's going to be successful as well the next few years. But I don't want to lose this feeling that I have for the game. I love the game. I want to sit on a couch. I think I said this earlier. I want to sit on the couch Saturday and watch the game and support rugby and Munster and, and Ireland one day. And hopefully I can give something back to kids one day, uh, coaching maybe, and um, something come out of that, you know. But um, yeah, I, I, yeah, the time for me is right. I'm very, very excited about the future. And I'm very, very grateful that I can um, say, that's it. I'm walking away on my terms. So what's next then? Uh, what's next? I, I'm going to go into property development uh, with my brother-in-law. And um, they, I'm going to take off anyway for the first three or six months, really. So I'll probably just start a new year. Just enjoy myself with the family, uh, getting back to the farm, um, putting a bit of work in there. And just, uh, yeah, run around with a little one, chase her <laughs> and not being tired, you know, and uh, just enjoy myself and then yeah, I'll start. Uh, I've got uh, a few things still in Ireland that's going, uh, the five box range. Um, I don't want to plug a, f a few things, but uh, and the sausages, you know, so there's a bit of South African taste left behind or a bit of CJ, if you can say, really. 
Um, but yeah, I've got a great plan. Very excited about that. I'm looking forward to that. It sounds good. And will you train every day? Do you think yeah, one day, yeah, yeah. one day's good? Like yeah, I would like to train. Look, I've got a very fit family. So um, I don't want to be the last one uh, finishing a 5K <laughs> or a 10K or a fun run or whatever. So I'll, uh, not in the first few months, probably let my body just grow back to normal. And then um, I'll be put down the shoulder to the wheel and start running again. Right, well, CJ, thank you so much for sharing your story. You've given Munster and Ireland so many great days. And I expect it's when you're back home and in South Africa and you're sitting down that you'll really appreciate uh, what you gave people because there really were some, some brilliant times. Thanks so much. And thank you to everybody as well for listening and watching. Please like, subscribe and leave a review.